Achtung, achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray and James Holland. And uh, James, we have a special guest to talk to today. Who are we talking to, James? Well, today we're talking to Julia Jones. And Julia is a writer, editor, campaigner. We've just been learning. Um, and, and your father was in the Royal Navy Naval Volunteer Supplementary Reserve. So the RNVSR. Um, and you discovered this because you're 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 talking to us from your attic room. And I can see the kind of eaves of the uh, of your roof behind you, and um, that's where you found your <laughs> father's a sort of collection of your father's papers, didn't you? And and um, learned what he'd been up to during the war. And he was one of these yachtsmen who had experience of sailing around the Solent or wherever, but but you know of yachting before the war. And suddenly thought, actually, I've got a I've got a role I can play here, and so joined the navy. I think Dad was um, one of the least hearty and experienced yachtsmen, and part of his problem was he was he was a farmer's son from Suffolk, and his father had died, um, and he was actually working in Birmingham um, as a as a sort of very junior clerk. But he did absolutely love sailing in the water. He and his brother completely rejected farming um and and simply loved sailing and they used to pot around on the river deben um and you know dad would plead for with you know local barge skippers to take him out but he wasn't you know he wasn't a member of the yacht clubs of england somebody said very nicely julia are you telling me that the war was won in the yacht clubs of england and I, <laughs> i'm saying no i'm not exactly telling you that um i'm just saying that that purely by accident, I found out about this organization called the RNVSR. And I hadn't a clue, you know, what, what it meant, you know, what, what was it supplementary to, you know, who, who, who joined it. Um, but what I had found at that point was my father's 21 year old diary, which showed how very un gung ho he was and how very much he dreaded the being a war. But even more than that, he dreaded being being a coward um and it was terrible there was a there was one thing in his diary where he's um he's saying um chamberlain no atley comes to do a recruiting drive in birmingham dad was living in birmingham then and he really means to go and instead he goes to a hotel and he just has too much he gets drunk but in the end you know he realizes that he's absolutely got to do something so he takes himself down to hms flying fox um which is the sort of recruiting centre for the RNVR in Bristol. And he's very lucky because he meets a man from Waldingfield who's in charge, the, the commander's away. Um, and the chap, from, they talk about the Deben and, you know, how lovely the Suffolk coast is. And, and Dad's allowed to, as he puts it, fondle the guns. Um, <laughs> so that all goes very well. But he knows perfectly well that the Navy aren't going to accept him, certainly not as an officer, because he has terrible eyesight. Um, and and he, he tried earlier in, in February of 1939 and just got chucked out straight away. But luckily for Dad, um, and I think luckily for me as well, um, the Munich crisis had been such a disaster when they tried to mobilise the Navy. Well, they did mobilise the Navy. The, the Navy um, mobilised um, very smartly. Um, and they did call up their regular RNVR their re and their regular RNR reservists. And they all went to the wrong place and nobody got paid. And it was just an absolute administrative mess. And there were, you know, questions in the house, as it were. Um, and in June 1939, the Navy finally said, OK, people can join the RNV SR, even if they've got rubbish eyesight, if they're any good at accounting. And as dad, you know, was just, um, working up on the Birmingham Stock Exchange, um, he was, he, he writes in his diary, the Navy have created a reserve just for me, he says. <laughs> um, so, so that's brilliant. It, it, in the course of the war, it became sort of less brilliant, um, because for the first, couple of years, he was um, on a depot ship, um, a submarine depot ship. So he was meeting the most tremendously heroic, um, you know, in the classical sense, the most tremendously heroic people. You know, he said, you know, we dined for um, men who, who w went on to win VCs in, in our wardroom. And at that point, if you're, you know, a 21 year old and you're, you're just, you know, you're translating, you're doing, he, he did cipher work um and and that sort of admin but you're seeing 
you know, the chaps who either come back or who don't come back. And, and you know, um, I assume some of the, um, whitewashes that, you know, the, the things that aren't being told because your job is to, um, translate things into code or out of code. Um, it must make you feel quite sort of inadequate, don't you think? Um, you know, that you're not the ones at the sharp end. You're, you're the, you're the backroom boys. And I think this must be a feeling that's probably shared by a lot of people. Um, I know some of the, the, the much more properly yacht clubby gung ho people who I met in my book, um, were not sent to sea as they wanted to be sent to sea, but they said, no, your abilities are more useful to us, you know, in naval intelligence or in, in um, weapons development or wherever it might be. But it was hard for them because, because they joined up because they were yachtsmen, because they loved the sea, because they felt they had something to offer, you know, very directly. But anyway, yeah. I, I mean, Gina, I sort of, you know, when when he was just talking about your father, but, you know, this ordinary person, you know, he's young, he's living in Birmingham, he's sort of minding his P's and Q's, not military at all. I mean, I think you've just absolutely hit on the essence of what I think it is about the Second World War that makes us so enduringly fascinated. It's, it's, it is, and, and Al and I have talked about this numerous times before, it's this idea of ordinary people getting caught up in something extraordinary and having to kind of step up and... and do something completely out of their comfort zone and and do something that they would never normally expect to do and how you then fare with that and i suppose you know for for all of us you know it's it's that question isn't it about what would we have done in that circumstance and that if we'd been in that situation how would we have fared how would we have managed and coped and all the rest of it um and and you know your father was an example of that you know it's your father's an example of that and i think you know the rnvr and the rnvsr um, are so sort of, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of absolutely part of that for the strange phenomena that lasted during the Second World War of, of these ordinary people suddenly finding themselves in this extraordinary situation. Yes, yes, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. At, at the time, I happened to have a 21-year-old um, who was at university in Birmingham, and I looked at him and I thought, oh, my God, you know, if that had been, you know, if we'd rolled back the clock to 1939 and that had been you. Um, because one of the things I, I did notice um, was how very lacking in confidence um, Dad was. <laughs> Some... I, I, I read your book, James, um, Heroes, and, and, and some of those, some, some of the young men in that book, you know, are so, um, full of testosterone, if you like. Um, they, they, they and, um, you know, they, they're clearly, and, and some people were, because I think we have to remember that this generation had already seen their fathers go through a war. So they, this, this question, which to us is a slightly academic question, what would I have done? To them, I think, was a much more direct question and a much more emotive question, you know, because they, they, they're sort of measuring themselves up against their dad, or they don't have a dad to measure themselves up against because he's dead. Um, you know, that, that was a you know, serious... Or in the case of someone like Tubby Crawford, who was uh, a submariner, yes. um, who I featured in that book, you know, was just born with just an unbelievable sort of phlegmatism that just... You know, he just didn't particularly ever get ruffled with anything. Imperturbable, you know, I think, was your word, wasn't it? Imperturbable, yeah. yeah. You know, and he and both him and Wanklin, his commander on on HMS Uphold, were were both cut from sort of very much the same cloth. You know, they just well, that was one of the things that interested me. Um, was so, of course, lots of people could volunteer in lots of ways. You know, you could join the TA or something like that, couldn't you? Um, but so because I love boats and I've always been. You know, um, brought up w with that feeling. I was asking myself, was, is there something special that yachtsmen were bringing by virtue of the fact that they were yachtsmen? Um, that's why I got quite excited when I reread, well, when, when I first, um, brought out Dad's little book, um, and people said, Oh, it's like Riddle of the Sand. So I went back and I reread Childers. And I could see that what he was arguing for was that there were actual particular qualities that a coastal sailor could bring by virtue of being a coastal sailor. And although <laughs> my family will, will tell you that when I'm in charge of my boat, I'm not imper imperturbable, <laughs> it is a very good thing to be. And you have to think about your boat and not about yourself or your feelings or anybody else's feelings. Because if you 
if you keep your boat safe, you keep everybody safe. Whereas if you say, oh, I mustn't shout at little Neddy because um, I'll hurt his feelings and you run on the rocks, then you haven't done anybody any favours. So I did, I did start to think, and Childers also helped me because it made me think of the particular qualities of being amphibious, which I think for the Second World War especially was a really useful, um, a really useful thread. And it's one I tried to follow through the book. Um, so because it seemed that the Navy had forgotten so much in the period between the wars, um, and so many things had to be relearned, um, that, you know, it, it took them all that time till we got to the Normandy landings for those particular, um, practical necessities, I think, as well as qualities, um, to, to be pulled together in such a organized way that we could actually get back at Operation Neptune at the Normandy landings. Um, but there were lots of different strands, um, which, you know, had to be thought about. And I'm not saying that the yachtsman won the war, but I'm saying that quite a lot of the strands <laughs> that I'm interested in appeared to be useful ones. Uh, James, you might not be surprised by this, but, but, but my father, the, the colonel who, you know, he built a boat and we, we went on sailing holidays <laughs> when I was a teenager. And what, how you're describing, how you're describing uh, sailing there, um, Julia, entirely fits my experience of being <laughs> one of his crew. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think there is an interesting point here, and I and, and I, um, you, you know more about it than I do, Julia. But I would instinctively agree with you, and I think one of the really, really interesting things about the part played by the Royal Navy in the Second World War was the Royal Navy was all, already quite big in 1939, and obviously it was the world's largest navy in 1939 as well. So you've already got that kind of hard carder of, of, of permanent professional naval types. But because Britain is an island nation and because it particularly suits itself to, you know, particularly um, attracts a large number of people who like messing about in boats... When it comes to suddenly expanding it in the Second World War, you've already got a, a, a number of people like your father um, and others who have that understanding of tides and winds and even something as basic as sort of, you know, clove hitches or whatever. Um, and, and you know, that gives you... So when you're joining the uh, this, you know, you're trying to rapidly expand the Navy, you've got a sort of base knowledge there that that is already kind of built in before you've started your military training, which I suspect is very, very useful. And what that means is that when you need to spread your officer cadre, your permanent officer cadre, wider and kind of expand your officer, uh, your, your number of officers um, and sailors with pre-war non-professionals, members from the volunteer reserve and all the rest of it, you've got the you've got a hardcore of people that know a basic amount about yachting and sailing to be able to fill that, that those holes very, very quickly mm. in a way that a continental power might not. And I think that is an advantage. And was an advantage for Britain in the in the second Yes. War. I think I think there are various points there. Though. I mean, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the Admiralty su surprised itself when, because they were trying to, when, when they saw that, that Germany had sort of abandoned the two power standard and the sort of Navy arms race was on in the middle of, you know, in, in sort of 1935, 1936, they started, you know, building more warships, which is, which is what, you know, the Admiralty likes to do. When in doubt, build a warship, you know, the bigger, the better. Um, and, but they were very broke. They'd sacked so many um of their experienced officers um in the 1920s i mean just you know, i'm sure there were massive culls in all in in the army as well but in in the navy it was it was sort of huge um and they the they had the regular rnvr but that was sort of capped to a certain level um and so that wasn't going to be able to be expanded and also you had to pay them you had to pay you know um their expenses and their uniforms and things and they really wanted to spend all their money on warships and not on people so they, they put out this this um you know this little you know gentleman interested in yachting you know may like to sign up to serve um as executives you know as officers in the event of an emergency but they even surprised themselves i think i think there were about two thousand people which doesn't sound big but it was sort of very spontaneous and and very um sort of emotional 
so that was that was all good but they weren't absolutely certain what they were going to do with them because one of the things that had been forgotten in the period between the end of the first and the second world war was actually the use of small um small boats um particularly the sort of fast coastal motor torpedo boats motor gunboats um which eventually my yachtsman <laughs> started um working on so to start with they they'd got this um cadre of people with um yeah some some idea of of how <laughs> the winds and tides worked um but you know only in small scale but apart from sending them out um on patrol yachts and on minesweepers they really weren't sure what to do with them and it took quite a while particularly for the regular officers to get that sort of trust in the volunteer and 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 the big deal um was um and it was the big deal when the RNVR was first formed which before the first world war was were these people going to be amenable to naval discipline and that in the navy is such a big <laughs> thing um and yeah, yeah sure and one of the things that that really struck me was when i found my father's commission and it said you're going to have to be subordinate to people and people are going to be subordinate to you and i thought good god if you're reading that and you're a 21 year old you know who's just been a junior clerk um you know in 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 birmingham and suddenly you're in this this whole world where people salute each other and call each other sir and you know have to jump to it um but one of the interesting points um that people within the RNVR made was that actually they don't have to be quite so um on the dotted line as a regular naval officer because if because the, the navy is pretty harsh and i'm sure the army is as well but if you mess up you know there's going to be an inquiry there's going to be a court martial and and you know that's just going to happen and your promotion is going to be delayed or you're going to be demoted or you're going to be sacked and if you're a regular naval officer uh, uh, from those days anyway and you'd have been to Dartmouth when from when you were 13 what else can you do you know it's a, it's a real issue whereas if you know you're already um a KC um and and you've joined for the duration and you get sacked well actually you're still going to be a KC and you can probably argue with them anyway um it's it's well i said it's it's certainly i did find people um you know very much using that not that they were in any way they were quite romantic a lot of them about the whole you know the whole mystique of the navy the sort of whole nelsonian thing i mean the navy is massively romantic um i i i well you know if, if we if we have one but you know you know what i mean it it is yes. as, as james was saying it's sort of deep within yeah, us isn't you know, it absolutely. Sort of, um you know yes well who would you rather be wellington or nelson is what that boils down well, to absolutely <laughs> Although, to be fair, to answer, actually, Al, if you're working on outcomes, you'd be better off as Wellington, wouldn't you? Well, of course, but what, what's better <laughs> yeah. than dying at the pinnacle of your finest victory against, uh, you know, I mean, the, the Nelsonian legend yeah. is, so, is so sort of perfectly formed. I mean, he, and, he, and he makes his exit at exactly the right moment as well, the way that, you know, Wellington, Wellington then doesn't, I suppose. Yeah. Um, uh, no, you, you, keep, <laughs> you, you, uh, you keep alluding to your sailors. So um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, no. So, so who? But well, you who, know what it's like who, when you've been writing about, you're researching about something, or you write a, bi- yeah. a biography. You do get a bit possessive, but I don't mean to be possessive. Well, no. But who? So, who are your? Who are your sailors? Who, aside from your father, who else is in the RN uh, VSR? Well, well, I think I think because I'm quite old, I'm quite lucky. I, I'm I'm a 1950s child, and so I, I did actually meet you know some of Dad's friends. My uncle was another one. He's he's. Um, in 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 the book and many people of course didn't talk about their experiences because they wanted to get on with their lives but my uncle was actually very sort of bitter and angry um he was badly wounded at dieppe um and and yeah he was quite cross about it so actually he did talk about it but there were other people and you know friends fathers who i met and i just thought they were stuffy old men you know um yeah but 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 actually the there's one particular, um, and, and she's one of my dearest friends. So, she, and she knows, she, she knows I think this. And her, her father, um, he was younger than my father and he came in right at the end. So I suppose I shouldn't really, he wasn't in the RNVSR because he was too young. Um, he, he joined the Royal Naval Patrol service. Um, but anyway, at the end, um, he was, he was there, um, doing his, his landing craft on D-Day. But in uh, our 
you know, growing up world. He always seemed very proper. And, you know, there were, he and his wife were sort of pillars of the church and the community. And, you know, I always felt I, you know, I, I should behave quite nicely um, when, when he was around. Um, I might even have thought he was boring. Um, but my youngest brother was sailing with him um, one, one time. And, and he had a very beautiful yacht, which had been designed for him. Um, by my uncle. So it was, a, it was a big, you know, it was all a big thing um, in a family. But anyway, Ned was um, sailing with Stuart and they were in France and some vandals threatened his yacht. And suddenly this, this mild mannered, rather short, quite pale, balding chap picked up his boat hook and ran at the vandals, flailing <laughs> the boat hook. And they, they, they fled. And Ned said, suddenly I realised that was a man who drove his, his, who was in charge of a landing, a tank landing craft in Normandy, age 20, you know, and, and that's, yeah, Amazing. and uh, you would understand that, James. Yeah. 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 How fantastic. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, um, I, and I'll stop calling them my yachts because they, 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 you know, they, they, they very much, um, weren't, but you get used to sort of, reading people's memoirs or, or, you know, sometimes being able to talk to their descendants. And there is a, there's a sort of, um, if you're doing this in a very academic way, you, you would say that the research is a bit slewed um, because obviously it's the people who survive who you know most about and it's the people who are sufficiently, you know, confident or successful to write their memoirs that you know most about. Um, but of those people, you know, there's obviously there's Nicholas Montserrat, you know, now he's he's a really great example of somebody whose mother had told him ever since he was a little boy that every Englishman has salt water in his veins. And he said, no, I flipping haven't. And she dressed him up in sailor suits. And his father had been in the first war and had come back and simply didn't. And Montserrat describes it very well. He, he, there was just a complete absence. You know, his father, his father had been um, at Salonica. Um, and um he he'd been in the army medical corps um he was a surgeon in liverpool um but there was just a shutter came down um so he, he nicholas did that classic thing which i think um lots of us will understand of completely rejecting um his parents values he went to winchester and hated it hated conservatism hated anything to do with the navy or the forces so when the war came he didn't immediately although he'd been going to um anglesey on sailing holidays and he did actually love sailing and he was a good navigator um but he was a pacifist he was a socialist and he wasn't going to have any of this so he became um a stretcher bearer um in london um but of course in the first bit of the war there weren't any stretchers to bear in london um so there he was sort of whereas with the war at sea it, it got going you know pretty straight away you know there was there was um you know, mine clearance, the magnetic mines, there were, you know, all sorts of things happening immediately, um, at sea. And so by the spring of 1940, um, Nicholas was feeling, you know, quite uneasy with himself. And then his father sent him an advertisement from the Times and it, it, it truly said, you know, gentlemen who are interested in yachting. And I think the word is gentlemen and the other word is yachting, you know, should, um, sign up. And, and he just, he, he just did. And, and he's very, um, you know, as a, as a great novelist, he's very self aware. And he said, suddenly all those values that I've been rejecting all that time suddenly came back, you know, in, in full force. He said, you know, the Navy was like sort of Winchester in spades, as it were. Um, but he's very, very interesting. And, and he's interesting because he's actually writing during the war as well as writing after the war so you have you have the you know rather fascinating thing of of comparing what he says at the time about service in corvettes with what he says afterwards um you know and afterwards of course you know he gives us the cruel sea which is sort of you know iconic i think we need to take a break right now we'll be back after these propaganda messages from the world of capitalism Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. So did these RM, um, RMVSR types, did they tend to end up in smaller boats generally? 
smaller vessels. They went all over the. They went all over the place. I've, I've got. I've got. So, so it wasn't. It wasn't as though they were all heading off to MTBs and. Corvettes. Well, to start with, there weren't any MTBs anyway. I think we had six. No, and I, 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 I joke you not. At the end of the First World War, we had something like six hundred coastal motorboats. Um, at the beginning of the Second World War, um, although there'd been such. Um, technical advances in speed in every way you know speed in the air and speed um on the ground the the admiralty had simply not had not picked it up not 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 bitten it so it wasn't really until oh sort of 1941 late 40 41 um that the amateurs as they were called um started to um be called in, into um, coastal forces and coastal forces started to get going and uh, it, it, it when I was writing Uncommon Courage it did become very interesting to sort of as it were watch the progress of the war in a sort of larger sense um, sort of exemplified or as it impacted on the the fortunes of my my small band of, of yachtsmen so for instance Later in 1941, when the war had had spread, you know, tremendously to the Mediterranean theatre, and we were starting to run the Arctic convoys, and you, just generally speaking, the the war had got bigger um, in in many ways. Um, the RN officers who had first been commanding the um, motor torpedo boats as they came on stream um, were all shifted off, you know, to go and you know, work on warships, which was really sensible because they'd got the sort of technical know-how about how, you know, gun laying systems might work. And at that point there was a big step up for yachtsmen like Robert Hitchens, for instance, was a sort of classic he was a Cornish solicitor. Um and and he, he was one of most sort of um charismatic um leaders. And and yeah, so there was a big change um at at that point. By the end of of the war, um they were sort of everywhere. Um to start with, for instance, they weren't they they were forbidden to volunteer for submarines, for instance, because submarines were thought to be, you know, too special. By nineteen forty two, three, you'd actually got the first volunteer commanding a submarine and that was a wonderful man absolutely one of my heroes called edward young who was the product oh yes yeah. of course one, one of, of our submarines, submarines. And yeah. he was the production manager at penguin and for god's sake you know so so you, <laughs> was he, really he, incredible. he was he was he was the guy who put book. the penguin on the on the paperbacks really yep, yeah he really amazing. really was there's an astonishing little little sort of group of who I because they sort of knew each other of of sort of typesetters and and um printers and production editors one of the things that that some of my yachtsmen um including Quentin Riley got into was this um intelligence commando um setup um which was yeah which was um the 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 brainchild of Ian Fleming and and you know I know that all publishers and publicists you know they want you to bring in Ian Fleming at every point and and that's that's you know that's not necessarily relevant but actually his service at the Admiralty was very interesting in some quite um some quite nerdy ways I mean there were there were things in my father's um suitcase which I didn't understand until I um followed through um the career of in Fleming and, and in, indeed another of the typographers called a chap called Robert Harling, um, who was another of um, the RNVSR types. Um, and, and they were just trying to make um, the weekly intelligence that was sent out to the ships more sort of readable and interesting. And they were also, um, Fleming was very good on developing the inter-services topographical unit. Um, so you could get proper reconnaissance, which, you know, if you're thinking of getting back to beach type landings you do need you know proper beach reconnaissance um and again you know so one thing led to another so there was a a a, a very distinguished typographer called Rory McLean who was flatmates with Edward Young um and I, actually his 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 books haven't been um republished and 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 they're sort of not necessarily on my hit list either um but he was another one with bad eyesight um, and and 
but he got on as a liaison officer on a French submarine, and he's so entertaining. Um, but later on, he he joined the um, combined operation pilotage parties, the cops. Yeah, yeah, the copists. Um, and and there's a sort of extraordinary. Um, you know, if if you if you get to, later on in Uncommon Courage, you know, if you get a chance to look at it. Um, Sometimes that there is what I thought was an extraordinary sort of coincidence um, that there's Edward Young, who by this time is quite a senior submarine um, captain, and he's got his beautiful um, HMS uh, Storm, and and that they're out in Trincomalee, um, and Rory McLean comes out, and he's being sent to reconnoitre the beaches of Sumatra, and and Young has had a terrifying experience when he's had to put somebody ashore to do beach reconnaissance and it was very frightening for the submarine commanders because they had to sort of wait offshore you know not knowing whether somebody was going to come back on it he describes it very well in in one of our submarines um but um and and yes and so that 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 incident is in that book um but then rory comes out and he's he's with his um Cop seven, I think it was, it might be cop nine, um, and and he he comes up to Edward Young and says, oh, by the way, I'm I'm you know we're looking for a submarine to 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 pop us ashore at Sumatra, and, like, <laughs> and Edward Young says, not bloody like, no, he doesn't say, that, but, you know, that, that's what he says, and 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 Rory McLean writes, you know, he says, he said, had I but thought, you know, in in the years before the war when we were sharing a flat in London, that one day, you know, we'd meet. Um, you know, in in the Far East, you know, passing in the night on submarines, we would have rushed down to the Black Lion with shaking hands to have a pint. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. And and Jerry, tell me about about Peter Scott because yes. obviously we, we you know we know yeah. him for what he did post war, but and we you know I'm sort of aware that he's one of the characters um, um, that Elizabeth Jane Howard bases. You know, he he sort of features uh, anonymously, doesn't he, in in one of the, in the Casler Chronicles, I think. Yes, and and she. But she, anyway, she, but, she, but she I don't features... know much about him apart from what he did as a okay. as a as a naturalist after the war. I think one of the interesting things about well, there's many many interesting things about Peter Scott, who's quite a complicated character, um, and one of the things is after the war he gave up shooting. Um, you know, which is if if you're so before the war he was a keen punt gunner um and so his idea of um you know looking at geese as as many um you know i i don't want any sort of false was drifting around on on sort of backwaters taking pot shots at ducks and whatnot but no he was he was a lot more um he was a, a lot more of a naturalist even then um that he, he he wasn't just shooting for the sport he was shooting for the interest um and and the, the, there is that sort of odd um mix of um oh, i can't think of the right word there's the excitement of the early morning the dawn the being out there the light rises the shot the distance but there's also um the fascination with the quarry and and in the past many leading naturalists have also been um you know keen shooting men you know and and they get things and they 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 stuff them and that's how we know what they looked like but after the war um scott his his autobiography um in in the eye of the wind lovely book um but he he says that sort of after the war he just he just found he didn't want to do it but from my point of view scott is terribly interesting because he's a complicated and interesting personality um and also he has that particular um i either burden or advantage in that he's the son of scott of the antarctic you know therefore he's a bit special and he's got that responsibility of being a bit special and so when he first goes to sea and he finds he's he's really hopelessly seasick it's really embarrassing for him and and he has to get over it and i, I don't think the marriage to elizabeth jane howard helped enormously um and he, but he's desperately he, he tries desperately to get onto destroyers and because he has the good connections he does actually manage to blag his way on to a destroyer in the end and then he uses his particular knowledge um to develop systems of camouflage 
which of course you know if you if you are you know a, a um, wildfowler you, you're already quite interested in yeah. camouflage um, and you know how to break up the outline of something so he um, and 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 uh, yeah and he becomes he, he is brave um, he's quite often frustrated he's several times dead lucky not to be on the destroyer he wanted to be on because you know it gets massacred um, but at Dieppe for instance um, he he was holding out to get command of a de- destroyer and, and no um, amateur at that point had had command of a destroyer so they sort of said to him you know look we will give one to you but meanwhile there are these lovely steam gunboats and, and they're because most of the MGBs and MTBs were <laughs> they, they were really cruddy you know they were slapped together with sort of plywood and they had petrol engines and they did you know they just sort of blew up um whereas the german e-boats were were you know made of aluminium and they were round hulled and you know they did they were just you know superior in every way um and people like peter scott and robert hitchens were very angry when they realized the chances that the navy had had in the years between the war to have metal hulled diesel fueled um you know motor coastal forces instead of petrol fueled plywood things um but scott at, at, the, at the end of the war he even before the war was over in 1945 he caught up with his brother officers who'd been in coastal forces and got them to write down um quite a lot of their memories and and he so when he's at Dieppe, for instance, he writes down his own memories um, and he checks back because there's been another yachtsman on board who's been keeping the log because that's what, you know, yachtsmen do. Um, and, and the Navy has to do it. You, you keep you keep detailed log books. And he he describes very well, I think, the responsibility of being in charge of one of these very, very new, rather expensive, you know, classy little boats and the the carnage that was sort of coming down from the sky. And one of the things I, I, I hope I bring out in the book are the sort of different ethical imperatives, because one of the main ethical imperatives of being any sort of seafarer is you see somebody else in trouble at sea, you help them. You know, you don't care whether they're your enemy or whatever. And there's one particular moment, for instance, when, um, you know, Scott is trying to fish a German airman out of the sea and another German um, aircraft comes over and starts um, strafing them and and he has to decide to, to leave um, the leave the chap and, and get to hell out of it because he realizes that he's got this very expensive um, little boat and he sa- he, he writes that um, it was on the face of it not a not a sensible thing to do but I love the way he writes on the face of it because his humanitarian instinct to fish that chap out of the drink um, is clearly still preeminent, even though he knows that he that as the commander of um, SGB-9, he must you know, get the heck out of it. And those are the things, when I, when I was writing the book, it was those sort of ethical and emotional moments. Um, you know, I don't think I'm great at writing you know, I'm not a military historian. I don't think I'm great about writing at campaigns, but I, I think what did come across sometimes were the way in which being, as it were, an outsider in such a, you know, a very strong service as the Navy in wartime did set up, you know, various, you know, questions and, 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 um, conundrums. For people, and and that I found particularly interesting. Crises of morality. The the person I absolutely um, sort of fell in love with actually was was Neville Shute, um, because oh yeah 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 no he he and he wrote, but he also wrote fantastic war yeah. books, obviously drawn from his experience, yeah. didn't he? And I and I don't think uh, the Pied Piper's him, isn't Pied it? Pied Piper is absolutely him. But the the, the one that I think yeah. is a, is an absolute humdinger is is most secret. But I think I think. People haven't really looked at them as a sequence, you know, starting from whatever happened to the Corbetts, which is a 1938 book, then Landfall, when which um, is a sort of um, 
a misidentification of a submarine, then Pied Piper, which is the fall of France. Um, then he wasn't allowed to publish his next one because it's called, it was most secret. Um, and, and because he was in the RMVR, he'd signed up as an elderly yachtsman um, in the spring of 1940. And he thought he'd just be sent off, you know, on a nice little minesweeper somewhere. Um, but they noticed, of course, that he had this massive experience as um, a, 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 an aviation um expert. So they put him in the um, Department of Miscellaneous Weapons. And he was furious. He was absolutely furious. But he had to do it. And he was so stroppy that, 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 that was a, um, there's a saying in the department, it's called doing a Norway. And, and, and that means that you, you completely disregard whatever your admiralty um, advisor tells you to do. And you, you, you throw a wobbly and do what you were going to do anyway. Um, that, that's called doing a Norway. <laughs> but so what he was doing, so most secret, um, is about disgusting um, spraying of burning oil on um, German seamen um, who are uh, patrolling off the Brittany coast um, and and how this would stick to their skin and give them cancer and you know but it, it's, it's it's disgusting um, but yet at the same time in his day job he's at the department of miscellaneous weapon developing flamethrowers. You know, I mean, it's, it's astonishing. And it's, I find it very useful that he's got two names. You know, there's Neville Shoot and there's Neville Norway. Um, but, but yet they're the mm. same person. He, he was one of the same yeah, man. He, he was, he was, you know, in literary terms, um, you know, he was absolutely my hero. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's a terrific writer. There's no question about it. it really is. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? All these, I mean, I didn't. I was something about. Well, I wasn't expecting expecting it to be such a literary um, uh, slice of war history as well, uh, Julia. That's what, that, that's very very interesting. Is do you think that's because um, the the people from the novelist classes are yachtsmen or so, you, you, what? Do you think there's a do you think there's an entanglement there? Or, yes, I do. Al. Or is it, yeah? Yeah. And, I, and I, don't, I don't think of it as people from the novelist classes, but in my day job, um, I'm the literary um, reviewer for Yachting Monthly, and there is there is definitely a very and and you know if I if somebody says to me what are you interested in, I say boats and books, um, and and for the cruising yachtsman, not the racing yachtsman, the two things are very intimately linked. Um, particularly when I was a little girl, um, because our, our boat was Peter Duck, who's Arthur Ransom's boat. Um, and one of, one of, one of the things, um, that I soon discovered, um, was, you know, my parents would get a bit sort of, you might, get this out a bit bit sort of stressed and and you know there were times on the boat one wanted to get the heck out of the way um yes and i was very lucky i had <laughs> because i was the oldest child i had it's this lovely little quarter berth which was like a little sort of cave and you could get in and you could read and read and read and in those days um nowadays you know you can take your iphone or something on board with you but yeah. in those days if you were having a family sailing holiday um you know for sort of you know probably go on board for two or three weeks in the summer um you know when you were anchored in the evening um you know what did you do well either you read but my brothers weren't the keenest readers in the world and what was lovely actually on um peter duck was because she, she's not a big boat and and she's not parceled out into separate cabins so my parents had the sort of middle bit and um I had one end bit and one of my brothers had the other end bit and the other brother was sort of hung up in a hammock. Um, and <laughs> and um, one of my best memories was that mum and dad used to read us the Hornblower stories. Oh, at, at my night. goodness. Uh, it was just, well, that's, yeah. Yes. Exactly. That's what I would read. Really that's well. what I would read on the when we were on our, you know, we, we, when we went sailing. Did you? Yes. Yeah, I'm a massive, a massive, massive, massive well, Hornblower fan as a boy. Absolutely. Well, what's not to like? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Did you do Patrick O'Brien? No, no, hornblower. You either love him or hate him. I Just don't. hornblower. <laughs> I, d I think. Yeah, I no, think. Very good. Very good. Also, Patrick O'Brien is a sort of you know he's 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 an arrivist, isn't he? I mean, you know, C. S. Forrester was the bloke who was you know who was <laughs> yes. right there. Um, at yes, the time. absolutely. Um, I tell you what's a good book if you haven't read it for a while. And that's the Good Shepherd by C. S. Forrester. Oh, I know. We well, know. We well, well read yes, but read yes, that. read that and the ship yep. and the ship, yep. which is its sort of companion yep. piece. Yes, we. Fantastic. Well, I mean, yes, I mean, we've been with with the podcast at the in the depths of the first lockdown. I recorded those as as audio books for our red, regular listeners. Oh, did you? So, um, oh, brilliant yeah, thing so to do. I, 
I know those books mm. sort of yes. from having had to read them aloud, and uh, um, which is, after all changes changes the nature of a novel in lots of ways. It's a really good if, thing if, to do, isn't it? Is, is, yeah, is to yeah. read stuff aloud. Yeah. Yeah. How does it actually sound out loud? Is it, 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 yeah. A, 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 re- a mark of a really good writer, and Forrest, of course, is in. You know, he's writing those books as propaganda. At the, you know, by 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 the yes. by, by the t- time the, the war comes, he's he's fully uh, sort of embedded in, uh, in in producing those sort of books, even though they seem to have this extraordinary verisimilitude. You know, I think the, I think to, the understanding of read. propaganda in the Second World War was quite an intelligent understanding. It wasn't the sort of like Northcliffe propaganda from the first. World War, you know, it, it, and that's why I thought it was interesting that people like Montserrat were writing. Um, he wrote H. M. Corvette um, during during the war. But the other thing about yachtsmen and books is is the imperative to keep a log. And if you're, and that this is why I think the Riddle of the Sands is, as as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's it's the sort of the uber text um, because what that book is doing, it's it's based on true records of a true cruise um, taken by Erskine Childers in, in 1897, um, but, you know, but with a story added to it. But cruising yachtsmen always write up their log. And then it's terribly easy just to, because there's this um, sort of duty on you to take notes of, you know, whether the rocks um, at the opening of somewhere are exactly where the pilot book says they should be or have the sands shifted. You know, there is, there is a sort of, a sort of, um, communal, um, responsibility to, you know, notice these things and pass them back, um, you know, to, to, this. Um, you, you very soon start to do a little sketch or you write a little, you write a little bit more. And also because, because the sea and rivers are, are so beautiful. Um, I, I, I do think it, it, um, sparkles even the most prosaic person, you know, in, into, um, you know, moments of imaginative and creative fantasy. So I, I, I do think that there is a very, um, not, not necessarily a crossover into fiction, um, but a crossover into, into, you know, writing, writing your adventures. Because it always see, if you, even if you just go, cause I'm a very unadventurous sailor, but even if I'm just going down the river, it, it feels like, an adventure, you know, and I, I feel like I want to not necessarily tell somebody about it when I get home, but I, yeah, I feel like writing it down when I get back. Um, so yeah, so it, 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 I suppose it is quite a literary book, but yeah. Well, um, Julia, thank you so much for, for talking to us. And, um, obviously this is a book for my father with his sailing, um, propensity so oh, I will, do I will, yes it's got the colonel's name all over it's it like it has got the colonel's name all over it yes yeah yeah <laughs> do, do you want do you want me to send you a proper copy because i think you've only got oh, a pdf or something oh that would be wonderful yeah? yeah that would be fantastic go on then yeah, 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 super. well um thanks everyone for listening we will see you all again soon and a huge thank you to julia for joining us today bye bye thank you julia thank, thank you very much for having me